Good morning and welcome to the First Parish in Framingham. Welcome if this is your first time joining us and welcome back if this is your community. Welcome if you celebrate St. Patrick's Day and welcome if you do not. First Parish in Framingham is a welcoming congregation. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you move around in the world, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We welcome you here in the meeting house or on Zoom or wherever and whenever you may be watching this service in the future. I am Diane Bassett. I use she, her pronouns. I serve on the Board of Assessors as Clerk of First Parish, and I am happy to be your worship associate this morning. Please be sure to read the announcements in the order of service. Immediately following worship, you're invited to join us for coffee hour in Scott Hall just across the courtyard. If you're lucky, there will be tidbits left over from our community breakfast this morning. I want to say a special thank you to Beth Walton. Do I see Beth or is she still over there? Beth's leadership of the community breakfast this um, church year has made an enormous difference in rebuilding this community and helping to fight the epidemic of loneliness that exists. And so if you have a chance to thank her during coffee hour, please do. I also want to be sure you remember that this afternoon at 3 o'clock, Dean will be with his band, and I'm told special guest Tom Greeley will join the band for a concert, a free concert in Scott Hall. So I hope some of you will be present there. Please take a moment now to turn your phones or other devices to their quietest setting. While beeps and buzzes can be distracting, we of course welcome your human noises, cooing, babbling, laughter. We especially love the sound of your singing, so please join in. This morning, we welcome the Reverend Jennifer Johnson. Reverend Johnson currently serves as minister of First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. She answered the call to ministry in midlife after experiencing for herself the saving grace of UU spiritual community. Prior to ministry, Jennifer worked for many years in nonprofit communications. She shares her home in nearby Franklin with her partner and their two young adult daughters. Reverend Johnson, we are so glad to have you here with us. Since 1701, people have gathered as this community to rest or recharge, to be challenged or affirmed. Those people are just like you. You belong here, maybe only for the next hour, but we hope for longer. We're happy to have you with us. I invite you now to take a comfortable breath in and out. Continue to take a few more comfortable settling breaths and begin to release whatever you need to let go of to be more fully present to yourself, to one another, and to the sacred in this time and place. Each time when we gather, we light the flaming chalice, the symbol of our faith to mark this time as special, a time of part, a holy time. The words this morning are light is returning, written by Kate McPhee. Around us, light is returning. It rekindles the spirit of life in the skeletons of trees. It brings forth new shoots from the soil. It wakes us from our winter slumber and invites us to see what lies beyond. We light this chalice in the spirit of our Earth's awakening and to reaffirm our commitment to the value of our home. Now please rise in body or in spirit to sing and join with me in singing our first hymn, Gather the Spirit, number 347 followed by our sung and spoken affirmations.
is the doctrine of this church. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve all life with compassion, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. This is our great covenant, one with another and with our God. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Jennifer Johnson. My pronouns are she and her. And I have a story for you this morning. It's a story not from a book, but a story from my own life and family. And I'm going to need some helpers to tell the story. Um, I brought in a prop from home, and I wondered if I could get some help from maybe our younger ones. Would you be willing to come up and help? It'll be fun, I think. I think you'll like it. Can you tell me your name? Emmy. Emmy? Dante, so nice to meet you. So I have this prop from home. Could one, do you know what this is or have a guess? It's a measuring what? You're on the right track. Yeah, it's a, it's a tool for measuring. We have inches and centimeters marked on it, kind of like a big, big ruler. What do you think it measures? Stuff. stuff? What kind of stuff? <laughs> well, it looks like it might measure plants, but what it's for is to measure children as they grow up. I had a feeling you might be onto it. You are onto the right track. This is how we measure kids growing up. I have two kids at home. And I think they're about done growing up. My younger daughter turns 18 in two weeks. But I want to tell you a little bit about how she grew up, how she grew tall. We're going to track how Carly, her name is Carly, and how she grew. So we're going to start from the time when Carly was a baby. Emmy, do you want to come help with this? This would be a good job for you. What's this a picture of? You don't know? Baba, something you were a few years ago. You want some help? We'll see if anyone else can help. What's this a picture of? Yeah, a baby. This is my baby, Carly, when she was really little. So everybody starts out as a baby, and we start off little. So Carly started off. Can you help stick this little picture of baby Carly right on that Velcro right there where it says one day? And maybe you're, are you brothers, siblings? Are you, no, you're, siblings, you're friends. Yes, okay. So Dante, can you come help with this part? No, no, you were a baby once, yeah. What number does that say? 22. When Carly was one day old, she was 22 inches. That's all the way down here, pretty little, right? Although some of you may know for a baby, that's not that little. <laughs> so, yeah she, yeah, she was 22, about two feet all the way down here. But for the next five years, she grew and grew and grew like kids do until she was how old? Do you know those numbers? It's OK if you don't. Yeah, 4, 7, 47 inches. She grew from 22 to 47. That's 25 inches. She grew over two more inches, and this is what she looked like. Yeah, you want to put it there? What looks different about Carly in this picture? What's different from when she was a baby? She's a lot bigger. Yeah, she has a lot more hair. 
who's a bald baby. You want to put it back there? Now we have another picture of Carly. How does she look now? Uh, 11 years, and that's going to go right here. Can you reach that one? Right there. And that number, do you see that number? 68 inches. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. 66. You're right. I need a better prescription. 66 inches. So she grew from 47 to 66. That's 19 inches. So not as much from one to five, but still a lot. Yeah. And her hair grew longer and she looks a lot older too, right? And we have one more, one more. Do you see what age that says? Yeah, we can measure you too. <laughs> 17 and three quarters, right? So she grew another, she got to 70. So. In those six years, she stopped growing as tall, right? Instead of growing 25 or 19, she grew four inches. She got all the way up to 70. And this isn't exactly right, but I think you can see she grew quite a lot taller than me. I have big heels on. So Carly grew all the way up to be five feet and 10 inches. You wanna put that there? Got it. Right, so that's how Carly grew up, and we think she might be done now. She was kind of hoping to get to 72 to six feet, but almost. Her sister, Amelia, was all the way down here, because why? Like trees, we all grow. What, was, what were you gonna share? I was gonna, I was gonna say that people uh, can't always grow the way they want. Right? We don't really have a lot of control over how tall we grow. And we all grow different sizes. Some grow tall, some medium, some small. Kind of like how trees grow up into different sizes. But I wanted to also talk about another way that we grow that's kind of like trees. Trees grow up really high, but when they're done growing up, how do they, do they keep growing? How do they keep growing? Any ideas, anybody? How else do trees grow? They grow wide. Sometimes people grow wide. That's right. They grow flowers. You can see down here, there's some cherry blossoms. What else do they grow? Cherries. They grow fruits. They grow flowers and fruits. Even when they're done growing tall, they grow fruits, they grow gifts that we enjoy, that we like to eat and that help us grow. And I think people are like that too. People don't just grow up. Even as we're growing taller, we grow gifts, kind of like fruits and flowers. So I brought some of the gifts that Carly has grown over the years. You know what this is? <coughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a baseball, or actually, it's yeah, well, sorry, it's a softball. Carly plays softball. So, do you want to put that here? Yep. It's just very much like a baseball. So, if you put that way up, good job. So, between the time when Carly was five and eleven, she discovered that she's an athlete and that she loves athletics, especially softball. And then, as she kept growing taller and taller, she also grew, what's this? Music. She discovered that she has a passion for music. She learned to play the bassoon and the clarinet. Do you want to try that one right there? And she kept growing but not quite as much. Even though she wasn't growing as tall, she was still growing gifts to give to the world. And one of the things that became really important to Carly when she was a teenager was becoming friends 
and being a good friend and having good friends. So that's another gift she gives. I'm gonna have you hold that and here, we'll do this. Can you put this next to middle school, Carly? See that? Yep. And pretty soon, Carly's going to be 18, which means she's all grown up, right? All done growing, but not really. <laughs> she has a lot more growing to do, maybe not up, but growing gifts. She's thinking about going to college. And she's not exactly sure what the next gift is that growing, is growing in her, but she thinks it's going to have something to do with helping, helping being a helper and serving the world. So we'll put that one there. <laughs> it's trying to put together the broken pieces that we sometimes find in our world. So that's what's growing next for Carly. And I would like to invite you, all of us, to think about even when we're done growing up, how do we keep growing? What gifts do we grow? What things that we love to do? What new skills that we're learning? and think about those and help them to grow. And before you sit down, would you like to see how tall you are? Here, stand right here. Turn around. Okay, I see that you are 40, 45 inches. Way to go, good growing. Thank you to my helpers, thank you. We will sing them out with Go Now in Peace. Surprise, Dean. Dr. Vivek Murthy writes, it is a world where we respect and value one another, where we look out for one another, and where we create opportunities to uplift one another. A world where our highs are higher because we celebrate them together, where our lows are more manageable because we respond to them together, and where our recovery is faster because we grieve and heal and rebuild together. Thus, we set aside this time in our gathering to share with one another the joys and concerns which are now shaping our lives. Just a reminder that you can submit your joys or sorrows either online or by writing them down in the black book that is at the back of the sanctuary. And after our final candle is lit, we will sing two verses of There is Love, and it's in the order of service. I begin with the sorrows of our gathered community. Abby Merson shares this sorrow, that her 80-year-old cousin is in the ICU fighting COVID. He and his wife were on their spring RV trip, and he's in a Tennessee hospital away from their home. And there are joys to share as well. Kevin Stern shares that he played and read with his nieces yesterday. It is a delight to help the five-year-old learn how to read. And Ben Long shares a joy that his brother Tim was accepted to work at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And so he'll be returning post-medical school to Boston. We'll light one final candle for all of the joys and the sorrows too great to share here. And let us now sing, There is a Love.
Shared silence is a rare gift in our culture, in this world that demands productivity and action, we often lose sight of the creative possibilities that are born out of intentional quiet. Here, in this sacred space and time, let us give ourselves and one another the gift of silence. We will begin with a meditation by the late Ojibwe writer and spiritual teacher, Richard Wagamese. Then words will give way to the quiet of breath and simple presence. I am not created or recreated by the noise and clatter of my life, by the rush and scurry, the relentless chase or the presumption that more gets more. No, I am created and recreated by moments of stillness and quiet. I am struck richer by a pure solitude that allows me to feel the world around me and lean into my place in it. I am not the rush of words in my life's narrative. I am its punctuation, its pauses and stops. I am my ongoing recharge. In the silence, I am reborn. For this gift of silence, we give thanks. In this springtime of our annual canvas, we take a moment to thank those who have already made their commitment to First Parish by returning their pledge information. And we remind you that you can do so during coffee hour today. And we encourage you to do so in the next few weeks so that our board and our finance committee can have the information they need to do their planning for our next church year. This morning, we also invite Joanne Sarkar to share a reflection on the place that First Parish holds in her life and for her family. So we joined First Parish around 2007. Ambar and I were two total agnostics with uh, diverse backgrounds and a young daughter. And we were searching for an inclusive community that would align with our values. I hadn't grown up with the church as a kid. Um, I was always a tiny bit jealous of my friends who seemed to have this whole other facet of their lives, a big connection that I didn't have. So I wanted that for my own child. So we were delighted when we found First Parish just a stone's throw away from our house. I checked the website and I was happy to see it was not a whole lot like the churches of my youth. The values expressed aligned nicely with our own and we thought it might just be a good fit. After our first fact-finding visit, we literally never looked back. <laughs> we were graciously welcomed by so many people at that coffee hour. We felt like we had found our people. Over the years, we've both been involved with the church in various capacities. I was on the RE committee for a while. Ambar was on the Board of Assessors for a while. 
When the church decided to host the Metro West Free Medical Program in 2008, that was a long time ago, man. <laughs> um, I immediately jumped on board and uh, I still volunteer there to this day. So we took a break from church in 2015 after we adopted our first puppy and were completely overwhelmed. Uh, life happened and that little break lasted seven years. But in that time, there was still no question that we would still support this church financially. The church was already a part of the fabric of our lives and we felt we absolutely must preserve it. I had maintained a connection with the church through continued volunteering at the Women's Health Clinic for the free medical program. And in 2022, my good friend at the clinic, Susan Moody, convinced me gently that it was time to return to church. And I am so glad I did. Membership at First Parish has fostered a profound sense of con connection and community within our family. The friendships we've made within the church have enriched our lives immeasurably, offering us a sense of purpose and belonging that extends way beyond the walls of the church. Thank you. We thank Susan Moody for nudging you back to us. <laughs> the offering that we take each Sunday isn't just a stale habit. It's an opportunity to recommit to this place and this people. Our offering is an affirmation, a yes. When we give, we say yes to something that we value. With our gifts freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith. May our offering help us to practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation as a tool to empower our mission. The morning offering is generously given and gratefully received. This morning's reading is by the Franciscan friar and teacher of contemplative spirituality, Richard Rohr, and it's entitled, 
liminal space and inspired for me by this time of year. We had a beautiful day yesterday, a rainy one today, but both spring-like, leaving me wondering if spring is here to stay or not. We don't quite know at this liminal time of year. Richard Rohr writes, we often remain trapped in what we call normalcy, the way things are. Life then revolves around problem solving, fixing, explaining, and taking sides with winners and losers. It can be a pretty circular and even nonsensical existence. To get out of this repetitive cycle, Rohr says, we have to allow ourselves to be drawn into sacred space, into liminality. All transformation takes place here. There alone is our old world left behind, though we are not yet sure of the new existence. That's a good space where genuine newness can begin. We must get there as often and stay as long as we can by whatever means possible. This is the sacred space where the old world is able to fall apart and a bigger world is revealed. May it be so. And I invite you to remain seated for our next hymn, which we will sing through straight twice. It's number 396, I Know This Rose Will Open. you. It is wonderful to be with you this morning and to have your hospitality and to speak and preach from this remarkably high pulpit, <laughs> the highest I have ever yet preached from. So what a delight, but truly a delight to be here. I love meeting new congregations and it's such a beautiful space and a warm community. I can feel it in the air already. And your chalice is exquisite. Last month, my husband, Dave, and I decided that we needed to escape for a couple of days. We needed a break from the demands of work and the stress of coaching our daughter Carly, the almost 18-year-old, through the college application process. We needed a break from the routine of household chores, and most of all, from the ceaseless news cycle. We needed a break from the way things are. So we headed up to the main seacoast for a brief midweek stay at an idyllic inn, vacant of guests except for us. This was February, mid to late February. We thought we'd bring our snowshoes and hit some of the coastal trails we had researched. But when we checked the weather, we realized we'd find little, if any, snow and packed our hiking shoes instead. We had the trails almost entirely to ourselves. The quiet was interrupted only by the occasional caw of a crow and more dramatically by the thunderous crack of ice breaking in the estuarine streams that wound alongside us. It seemed 
The trails couldn't decide if it was winter or early spring. Along shady stretches, the path was patched with thick ice, but when the woodlands gave way to open fields, we found ourselves navigating long slicks of mud. It's the liminal season, I said aloud to Dave. What do you mean? It's still winter, but a little bit spring, not fully one or the other, an in-between time, a liminal season. On the branches of the nearby trees and shrubs, I observed those tiny, tightly wrapped winter buds. I thought about how they're full of stored up energy, full of potential. In the liminal season, unseen and silently, life is getting ready to grow again, to become new once more. Often when I am outside in nature at this liminal time of year, I connect with that other kind of liminal season, the inside kind, the liminal season of the soul, when we humans are getting ready to grow again, not physically, but spiritually. Richard Rohr describes it as that good space where genuine newness can begin. Late March of 2015, seven years ago, was a liminal season in my life. I was 41 years old. No, nine years ago, nine years ago. Like I wasn't 41 seven years ago. <laughs> I'm 50. <laughs> so I was 41 years old, happily married with two young daughters and a gratifying family life. My mother and I had grown closer in her grandparenting years. My sister had moved back to town to raise her two children alongside mine. I had nurtured a few deep, good friendships that widened our family circle. You might say my family life was blooming. Yet I had become restless. Something on the inside kept tugging at my chest and fluttering in my gut. Something new was trying to grow. And in early March of 2015, that something had willed me onto a jet blue flight departing from Logan Airport bound for Chicago. There I would spend 24 hours at a recruitment event for Meadville Lombard Theological School, a Unitarian Universalist seminary. When I arrived at my row on the crowded plane, I was prevented from entering by an older gentleman struggling to jam his briefcase into the overhead compartment. It wasn't going to fit. I waited. He looked queeringly at me. And I pointed to the window seat beside what I presumed to be his. Ever so slightly, he moved aside and gruffly told me to go ahead. His face was familiar, and his voice was unmistakably recognizable. For the next three hours, I would be seated beside the legendary Massachusetts representative in Congress, progressive powerhouse, one of the fir very first openly gay members of that institution, Barney Frank. <laughs> Call it a sign. Before his recent retirement, Congressman Frank had represented the district next to mine, and I'd followed his career hard not to. Admittedly, I was a bit starstruck, but I played it cool. He clearly was not interested in small talk, so I pulled out my freshly purchased copy of the Atlantic magazine while Congressman Frank scarfed a very crumbly cranberry muffin and rustled the pages of his New York Times. As I perused the articles of my magazine, I was suddenly stunned to find myself gazing upon a black and white photo of a much younger, cigar-smoking version of the very gentleman now dozing mere centimeters from my shoulder. <laughs> the accompanying article was a positive review of his newly published memoir, Frank, 
a life in politics from the great society to same-sex marriage. I read on. Turns out Barney Frank knows a thing or two about liminal seasons of the soul. I was struck by this quote from his memoir. It took me far too long to achieve a happy, fulfilling domestic existence. Looking back, I think I was pretty good at my job. Now it's time to be good at life. And with Jim's help, I think I can be. Jim is Frank's husband, whom he fell in love with at the age of 67 and married a few years later in 2012. At the height of a long, storied, and accomplished career in the halls of power, something new had been stirring in Barney Frank's soul, wanting and waiting to grow. Intimate love, companionship, domestic tranquility. My life trajectory in, is in one way the inverse of Barney Frank's. I met my husband when I was 15 and married him at 24. At an early age, my domestic life bloomed. I was pretty good at marriage and parenting, love and friendship, creating and managing home and family. On the other hand, I made, I struggled to achieve a fulfilling and satisfying vocational life. I had made a few false starts before settling into the role of communications director for a large nonprofit social services agency right here in Frank Framingham, actually. It was good work for an honest organization with caring people committed to serving the community. Life was pretty good. And yet, that something tugging at my chest had become harder to ignore, especially since I had embraced my volunteer role as a lay worship leader at my Unitarian Universalist Church. So that's how I found myself sailing atop a sea of clouds en route to my soon-to-be seminary, moved to tears by an article about Barney Frank while seated next <laughs> to the self-same Barney Frank, if that's not a sign. My brief encounter with the congressman illuminated a truth that has stayed with me ever since. No one of us develops in a straight line up. Like the trees and plants I observed along the main trails on that brisk and bright February morning, we grow and bloom in seasons, seasons of the soul. Each one of us blooms differently in our own unique time and way, not once, but again and anew for the entirety of our lives. We have some things to learn from the liminal season between winter and spring, when the plant life of our New England landscape prepares to break bud. The window next to my desk at home looks out on a large forsythia shrub. Throughout the winter, it is a tangle of sticks. As spring approaches, I grow eager for the sticks to ignite into a blaze of yellow blossoms. On my morning walks around the cul-de-sac with my dog, Cooper, I scan the ground of my neighbor's garden beds for the first signs of crocus, daffodil, hyacinth, breaking through the mulch cover. Heading back to our house, I check the swelling buds of the magnolia tree in my front yard, and I make a game out of guessing how many days till the first ones open. With eager anticipation, I wait for them to grow again as they wait for the right conditions of light, temperature, and moisture to reveal their new creations and when they do, they will transform the world. 
our shared world. The new blooms will soon soften and brighten the stark winter landscape with the textures and palette of spring. They will scent the warming air with the perfumes of their nectar. Their beauty will attract new generations of bees and butterflies and inspire new choruses of birdsong. Here's the lesson. We humans also have seeds of new life waiting to grow, waiting to transform the world with our uniquely human gifts, creativity, courage, passion, beauty, ingenuity, intellect, and most of all, love. Too often we get caught up in the bustle of living with what Richard Rohr calls the way things are or normalcy. So much so that we forget to notice the seeds of new vitality struggling to germinate in our souls. We miss the signs of the liminal season when that potential offering of the spirit is waiting for just the right conditions to break the surface and bloom in the light of the world. We forget our own capacity to transform the world to reconnect with our potential for transformation, Rohr says we need to be drawn into liminality. The sacred space of liminality is where all transformation takes place, he contends. There alone, the old world is left behind. Though we're not sure yet of the new existence, that's a good space where genuine newness can begin. Rohr insists that we must get there often and stay as long as we can by whatever means possible. So how do we get there? Maybe we're already here, here, right here, right now, in this sanctuary. Isn't worship, isn't it meant to be a space of liminality? Don't we make it a space of liminality? where we come to leave behind the world as it is, if but for a brief respite, where we come to imagine a new world and new ways of being, the world as it ought to be. We're not quite sure just what that new existence will be, but we Unitarian Universalists have some big ideas we believe it will be a world ordered not by dominance and greed, but by love and justice. And in that new world order, all beings will be encouraged and nurtured to bloom to their fullest potential and to give and receive the full bounty of our shared gifts. To bring that world, new world into being, our first task is to notice the new vitality germinating in our own spirits and give it the attention and support it needs to grow into the light of the world. Like Richard Rohr, Richard Wagamese encourages us to get to sacred space where we are created and recreated. He inspires us to cultivate those spiritual practices, those moments of stillness and quiet, those experiences of pure solitude that allow us to feel the world around us and lean into our place in it. Worship is where we come to cultivate spiritual practice, to cease the rush and scurry and the relentless chase of the world as it is. We come here to pause and stop, to be quiet and still, and in that quiet stillness, sometimes, we notice the seeds of possibility waiting for our attention. Here's another lesson. Plants need certain conditions to emerge from the shelter of earth and bud. People do too. What conditions support our new growth? What conditions give us the courage to unleash our emerging gifts from the protective shelter of our own soul? We need inclusion, affirmation, belonging, 
openness, curiosity, care, generosity, forgiveness, compassion, a loving push when we're scared, a shoulder to lean on when we faltered, a word of praise when we risk vulnerability. In short, we need each other and we need community. We grow best and most fully when we grow together. In our Unitarian Universalist community, that community that we all share across our congregations, I found people who want to imagine and shape a new world with me. I found people who want to discover and nurture their own place and part in that new world and one another's. In the sacred space of UU worship, I was able to heed the call of ministry stirring in me and in the fellowship of UU community, I experienced the conditions of belonging, compassion, and encouragement that I needed to answer that call and grow into a fuller expression of myself. We do that. We do that. And here's my closing lesson for you. The gifts that bloom from our souls don't exist in the vacuum of individual lives. Just as the flowers and bees and birdsong don't exist for flower and bee and birdsong alone, our human gifts are part of a complex ecosystem. The new bloom attracts the new bee that makes the new honey that I stir into the cup of tea that I sip in a moment of stillness while gazing upon the forsythia, newly ablaze with yellow light, inspiring me to think about and notice that new seed in my soul that wants to grow in response to the world's needs. When I allow that seed to bloom, then maybe, just maybe, sometimes, the gift of my ministry creates a sacred space for you to notice the new seed stirring in you. Even when we've grown, long since ceased to grow up toward the sky, even when gravity may be pulling us in the other direction, each one of us is still and always growing. There are always new seeds stirring in every human soul, working to take root, longing to bloom. They need our stillness and quiet. They need our attention and care so that we can grow again and anew through all the seasons and days of our lives so that collectively we can transform the world as it is into the beloved community of our dreams. May it be so, because we make it so. Amen. We're going to sing now. It's number 163, For the Earth Forever Turning. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join your voice in our song.
In a blessing well known among Unitarian Universalists, the theologian Rebecca Parker reminds us that none of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. What seeds of possibility are waiting in you? Let's make them grow together. Amen.